Tonight, from here in Maui, now the deadliest wildfire in modern American history. Frightening new video of residents escaping the flames. New images of the destruction left behind. FEMA touring the area's hardest hit. Dogs searching for bodies. And the anger from some residents now boiling over. Where were you guys? No. Where were you guys to try and get us out, evacuate us? Plus the journey into Lahaina, our correspondent in the heart of the burn zone, the workers combing through the horrific devastation and the homeowners seeing what was lost. The death toll rising from this terrifying house explosion outside of Pittsburgh, at least five dead, multiple homes destroyed. What caused it? It shook us off our feet, a couple doors off even. The DA in Georgia gearing up for a new indictment for former President Trump set to make her case on Tuesday. We talk with one witness just subpoenaed here in Hawaii, the decades old tradition that even the wildfires couldn't stop. This is NBC Nightly News reporting tonight from Maui, Tom Yamas. And good evening from here in Maui, where we have just learned that this is now the deadliest wildfire in modern U.S. history. And just behind us, this is the remnants of a house burned in another blaze as the entire island is battling ideal conditions right now for wildfires. What we know about this tragedy is already unbearable. Nearly 100 dead, more than 2,000 homes and buildings destroyed. But we are still so far from understanding the full toll and we'll explain why tonight. This is the overhead view of the sweeping devastation in Lahaina. We now know that only 3%, 3% of those homes have been checked for bodies. Just next to where we're broadcasting tonight, we have two cars incinerated by the wildfires. That right there was a Tesla. You can see what's left of the front row seats in the distance. That was a lush green hill now scorched to its core. It shows the power of these wildfires. The governor has been warning that the death toll will go up and there are still so many residents who escaped the flames but are now searching for their loved ones and tonight angry at officials and a warning system they say failed them. MG, wrong turn! Wrong turn! Tonight, this is what it looked and felt like escaping the Lahaina wildfire. Oh no! Oh no, guys! No, we have to leave! This new video showing the sheer panic as a family stuck in a line of cars had minutes to escape before the flames engulfed the road out. This is a disaster. That drive through hell is how Rafa Ochoa and his family made it out alive. I knew it was bad. And it was moving fast? And it was moving fast, really fast. It got, it got to our homes within seconds. With the fast-moving fire closing in on his home, Ochoa heroically grabbed both his kids and his friend's children. Their parents were at work and scrambled everyone out. Did you hear any alarms? Did you get any kind of warning? No alarms, no warning, nothing. No, no sign, nothing that, that we had to evacuate. Not even police rolling by telling us to evacuate or anything. The desperation of those chilling moments now turning to anger. Where were you guys to, to try and get us out? evacuate us no we're mad we're mad no we didn't just lose our homes we lost our town we lost history you know our kids are traumatized you guys messed up real bad hawaii emergency officials have said sirens on the island weren't activated during the fire though other alerts by phone and broadcast were having seen that storm we have we have doubts that much could have been done with a, a fiery, um, fast-moving fire like that. The scale of the devastating loss, now unprecedented in modern times. The deadliest wildfire in the U.S. in more than 100 years, claiming at least 93 lives. Just so you know, 3%, that's what's been searched with the dogs, 3%. When we pick up the remains and they fall apart, and so when you have 200 people running through the scene yesterday. I don't know how much more you want me to describe it. That's what you're stepping on. As FEMA and the governor survey the damage, search teams with cadaver dogs that just arrived to Maui yesterday, now scouring the ruins of historic Lahaina again today. Are you saying we're just at the beginning of this disaster? So for the first few days, we had done searches in the streets and the cars that were in the area. 
but we couldn't enter any structures. My police officers, they're trained to go chase bad guys, respond to robberies, take reports, but they're not trained to go enter smoldering structures to go look for human remains. Questions are also mounting tonight over the cause of the blaze, which is still under investigation, with FBI evidence recovery teams now on scene. And a new class action lawsuit alleges the destruction could have been avoided if the utility company had de-energized its power lines ahead of the high wind weather. In a statement, Hawaiian Electric saying the utility doesn't comment on pending litigation, adding in part that high wind protocols were followed and that at this early stage, no cause for the fire has been determined. This is Joel and Adela. For hundreds of families, the focus remains their missing loved ones and now a demand for answers. We're not leaving. None of us are leaving. We're going to rebuild our town and we're going to make it better. Rafa Ochoa there speaking for so many here in Maui. The hardest hit areas of Lahaina have been virtually inaccessible to homeowners with only a few allowed back in. And we haven't yet gotten a full view of the destruction just yet. But today our Miguel Almaguer made it into Lahaina just outside the restricted area. Tonight, these are the smoldering ruins of Lahaina, a desolate and dangerous landscape now only home to heartbreak. Our cars have burned up, their friends are dead, the dogs and animals are dead, everybody's dead. There's dead people in the water. The grim reality on the ground, the search for the missing is turning into a recovery effort. This is the epicenter where authorities continue their painstaking door-to-door -door search for bodies, a death toll that rises daily. Thank God that like we still have each other and we're all alive and safe and counted for. It's like we're the only things we have now because the reason that we had in the past is gone. Charlie Camaro watched the flames devour his hometown of 55 years. It looks like a war zone. What do you think? Yeah, it's bad. It's bad. Cell phones are ringing in bodies that they're finding. The pain here is palpable, and so is the anger. Five days after the fire, access into the heart of Lahaina is restricted. It is as if they cut us off from the rest of the world. After a treacherous cliffside drive on what is technically a two-lane road, residents and our team were granted access into the remote Oceanside town. But these are not the views anyone wants to see. The scope of the devastation is truly difficult to put into words. From every direction and every angle, all you see is home after home that's been destroyed. Rebuilding in this area will take decades. First allowed in two days ago, locals are now being pushed further away. Barricades and roadblocks deny residents of the one thing they want most. We all just want to see what's left of our homes, even if it's still standing. Calling the burn zone a toxic minefield. It is not safe. It is a hazardous area. Authorities insist they are working as fast as they can, but residents say official aid here has been slow to arrive. Volunteers taking their own boats in to help. We need medicine. We need pillows, blankets. Food. Good Samaritans are overwhelmed with the magnitude of the disaster. We're not trained to do this like this. Is... <laughs> I haven't gotten a break and I'm just been like, I have to help. Like, I have no other option. Tonight, the loss in Lahaina and Maui's misery. Miguel Amaguer joins us now live tonight from Lahaina. Miguel, when can most residents expect to be let back in? Well, Tom, that's a good question. People who live outside of Lahaina are being allowed back into this general area, but the burn zone behind me here, FEMA's in charge of that. That'll likely take weeks. We don't have a definitive date for that just yet, Tom. Back to you. Miguel Almaguer for us tonight. Miguel, we appreciate all your reporting. We're going to turn now to some other news and new details about that deadly house explosion in Pennsylvania that killed at least five people. New video shows just how destructive it was as officials try to figure out how it happened in the first place. Emily Aketa is there. Tonight, a western Pennsylvania neighborhood in pieces after a deadly house explosion rattled the area. The terrifying incident in Plum captured on a doorbell camera. You can see debris shooting across the whole block and the fireball that demolished several homes on Saturday morning. We have a whole building completely gone. We have copious amounts of debris. Greg Renko lives several doors down. 
as a police officer, you hear an explosion and you run towards it. Yes. Renko helped carry his neighbor from the raging fire, who now, he says, is in critical condition. We're fighting through the debris, the rubble, the fire, um, trying to get our neighbor out of there, but not a second thought was given. Authorities concluded their recovery mission at the decimated lots today. Five people were killed, including one child, and nearly 60 firefighters treated by EMS. As the cause of the explosion remains a mystery, gas has been shut off in this neighborhood as a precaution. At this point, we can share that our system was operating as designed. It's still too soon to, to estimate when service will be restored. Fire officials say the explosion leveled three homes and damaged at least another dozen in the Pittsburgh suburb. Such a force blowing out windows four homes away. I was sitting right here. My wife Families like right the Kolonkowskis now left to pick up the pieces and, and face the utter devastation that claimed the lives of five of their friends. I was with three of them the night before and, and then not even 12 hours later we find ourselves in this situation. Emily joins us tonight live from Plum, Pennsylvania. So, Emily, what's next for residents there? Well, Tom, residents here are still evaluating the extent of the damage, not just on this unrecognizable block, but debris was literally thrown across the neighborhood. Authorities say it could take months, if not years, to determine the cause of the deadly explosion. Tom? Okay, Emily Aketa for us tonight. Now to a possible fourth indictment for former President Trump. The investigation into the 2020 election interference in Georgia appears to be heading to its final stage, and more than a dozen people could be charged as soon as Tuesday. Ali Rafa has more. Is there any chance you take a plea deal in Georgia? Yes, we did nothing wrong. Former President Trump campaigning in Iowa this weekend. We Unfazed by the prospect of a fourth criminal indictment. This week, all eyes are on Fulton County, Georgia, where District Attorney Fonnie Willis will likely go before a grand jury to make her case that the former president and his allies broke the law when they pressured officials to overturn the state's election results. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes. Trump lashing out at Willis over the weekend, calling her racist and the probe a fundraising con job. Two people central to the probe, Georgia's Republican former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan and journalist George Cheedy, confirm they've been called to appear Tuesday before a grand jury. Saturday afternoon, I received a phone call from uh, the DA's office, uh, one of their investigators, to tell me that uh, I should come in Tuesday. Chidi providing NBC News this image of what he says was a secret meeting at the state capitol on December 14th, 2020. I walked in with cameras blazing and was almost immediately escorted out of the room. And I was told it was an education meeting, which is very apparently now not what was happening there. Trump isn't the only one in jeopardy. Legal experts say prosecutors may use a Georgia organized crime law to potentially charge more than a dozen of his allies. They don't want to take the risk of going to jail for five years, and they may decide to flip and cooperate with the government against Donald Trump. Ali, a possible arraignment in Georgia could be very different from what we've seen in the former president's other cases, correct? That's right. Cameras are barred from federal courtrooms, but state rules are different, and Georgia largely allows them, meaning that the former president's potential arraignment could be televised, Tom. Okay, Ali Rafa for us. Ali, thank you for that. We're also following a dramatic plane crash out of Michigan. This is just in where the pilots of this plane ejected just moments before it crashed. You see it here. It happened at the Thunder Over Michigan Air Show this afternoon. Here's the good news. Both pilots were rescued and they are expected to be okay. The cause of the crash remains unclear. And we're back in a moment with a warning about buying cheap prescription drugs in Mexico and why they could be deadly. Stay with us. We're back now with a new alert from the State Department. Many Americans go to Mexico to buy cheaper prescription drugs, but officials are now warning that pills sold there can be counterfeit or laced with deadly drugs like fentanyl. Aaron Gilchrist has this one. It's unbearable. Every day is unbearable because he's gone. Celia and Terry Harms hold tight to memories of their son, Jonathan. He was only 29 when he died back in 2017. The coroner's report says... 
from a fentanyl overdose. This was not Johnny scoring on the corner. This was a migraine sufferer that was trying to get pain relief and went to a pharmacy. Johnny Harms suffered from migraines his entire life, and during an episode on his vacation in Cancun, he went in search of medication at a Mexican pharmacy. He took a pill labeled migraine tablets and hopped a flight back home to California with his girlfriend. Within hours, Johnny Harms was dead. As soon as that poison was sold to him, it was just a matter of time before he would die. About 200,000 Americans travel to Mexico each year to buy prescription drugs, often because they're cheaper. The State Department is warning them, buy with caution, writing, counterfeit medication is common and may prove to be ineffective, the wrong strength, or contain dangerous ingredients. Those dangerous ingredients are exactly what researchers at UCLA found when they tried to buy prescription drugs in northern Mexico. They look like an oxycodone, but they contain fentanyl or heroin. Or they look like an Adderall, but they contain methamphetamine. And for a report in the L.A. Times, reporters bought and tested 55 pills from 29 pharmacies all across Mexico. They say a little more than half were counterfeit and many contained fentanyl. I'm very concerned that it seems to be something happening all over the country. Most of those tests were on purchases of individual pills, which could be used as party drugs. But Maryland Congressman David Trone, who asked for that State Department warning, well, I'm ex extremely concerned. Thinks all prescription drugs there are a danger. What's your warning to regular folks who are going on vacation in Mexico thinking that, you know, if they need to grab a Tylenol, they can? They run a huge risk. So they just got to stop buying drugs, any drugs in the Mexican pharmacies. Celia and Terry Harms say more needs to be done to get the word out so no one else has to go through the pain they've endured. He was just, you know, a wonderful son. From our perspective, he was murdered. If we can save other individuals by getting the word out, by educating people, that will give more meaning to Jonathan's life. Aaron Gilchrist, NBC News. And when we come back here in Maui, the Hawaiian tradition that even the wildfires couldn't stop. Finally, from here in Maui, an island steeped in so much history, once again, turning to its traditions. It's a tradition going back centuries. Hula, a symbol of the Hawaiian Islands. This weekend's festival on Maui, now a memorial to loved ones lost in the fires. We lament the loss of all of Lahaina through this. These dances with a history representing the sea and sky are now helping this community heal. Across the island today was about prayers and faith. At King's Cathedral, Maui, parishioners united in song. The church sheltering residents who lost their homes in the flames. We're feeding people, clothing people. It's been wonderful to see the love expressed, the aloha, we call it. As more aid arrives on the island, these volunteers together chanting and finding strength in their own language. And as the sun rose on St. Anthony's Church, this community is embracing one another as the long road to recovery begins. We will take care of each other no matter what. It's that coming together and helping one another that will provide that feeling and comfort. Maui Strong, that's NBC Nightly News for this Sunday. I'm Tom Yamas in Maui. We thank you so much for watching. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.